Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and Horror. Today we will explore the history of Valakan, a domain with a bloody past, marked by the horrors of a brutal colonization. Are you ready? So approach the clearing carefully and let us hear the tragic history of this realm through the chants and rituals of the priests of Utah, the dead god. Power of the Raven Scholars of the history of Valakan must be prepared for frustration as the past of this land seemed to be lost among myths and legends of its ancient fate. As in the lands of Kartakas, the people of Valakan do not seem to distinguish their myths and legends from their true history. This fact is further aggravated by the rustic culture of these people, which seems to see evidence of scholarship and academic studies as examples of ineptitude and moral decay. Despite these circumstances, the people of Valakan have countless social traditions and rites, and among them is the habit of storytelling, which are always preceded by the ritualistic phrase, listen to me. These traditions allow us to catch a glimpse of its tragic and bloody past, although it is not possible to distinguish between what is real or fictional in these fantastic narratives. In the remote past, the lands that today are known as Valakan were inhabited only by a rustic native people of these lands. This population survived from hunting and gathering and lived in absolute communion with nature. They worshipped the god Utah, a deity that resembles a green man and that is the very representation of nature. In this mythical era, Utah walked among the natives and was served and accompanied by a series of nature spirits and, and fey creatures who guaranteed the harmony and prosperity of these lands. This mythical era of peace and communion with nature was broken by the arrival of invaders from distant lands who came to the untouched forests to explore and to colonize this region. Although there are no accurate records, we can estimate the invaders' arrival around the year 320 of the Barovian calendar. The Valakan tales refer to these people as the Vazi, but their true identity is a mystery. Despite the name given to the invaders, we have not found any evidence to relate these invaders to the kingdom of Nova Vaza. The linguistic basis of the ancient Vazi language is also shared by the realms of Nova Vaza, Haslan and Kartakas, which may perhaps point out suspicions about the origins of these invaders to the distant world known as Toriel. The bards of the Kartakas domain, who also seem to have been conquered and dominated by the same invaders in the past, tell in their legends and songs that these invaders had come from the realm of Invidia, but we know that the able words of Abad from Kartakas are not to be trusted as a reliable source. Regardless of their origin, these invaders arrived in these lands with violence and greed in their hearts, and conflicts with the native population were not long in coming. These invaders carried out a real massacre of the native population which was largely exterminated or enslaved. This massacre was made even worse by the fact that such colonists brought to Valakan the White Fever, a disease that quickly decimated the native population, who had no resistance to such plague. These colonizers established their villages, dug mines in the mountains, cut down the primeval forests, and hunted nature's creatures almost until their extinction. The exaggerated tales of the Valakanis about these horrors tell us that the Arden River overflowed with tears and blood. This genocide had lasted for about 20 years and the native population begged to Utah to intervene and expel the invaders from these lands. 
the deity replied that he could not do anything against these invaders, as they lived outside of nature and were beyond his reach. The panther, the smartest of animals, was the one who found a way to save the land. The god Utah was to sacrifice himself, baiting those lands with his blood. The green god did so, and after his death, his spirit left to the moon, from where he observes his subjects and gives blessing to those who worship him. This act of self-sacrifice brought an end to the conflict in Valakan, as the natives and the invaders merged into a single people and harmony was restored. This new people, the Valakanis, inherited from the natives the wilderness law and independent spirit, but they also inherited the language, social customs and brutality of the invaders. This myth that explains the miscegenation of the population is often used to justify the violent behavior and tyrannical governments that prevail in this realm. Besides the folk tales and mythical accounts of their past, Balakan began to have its history at least remotely documented around the year 576 of the Barovian Canada, when Henrik von Ostling, the tyrannical mayor of Helbenik, managed to create the nation of Valakan uniting the thousand villages under a single government and declaring himself as baron and supreme ruler of these lands. Henrik reached such a position through a complex combination of murders, blackmail and political marriages that for 50 years he ruled Valakan with an iron fist, threatening anyone who opposed his commands. The land was suddenly surrounded by mists, and the tyrant ruled with impunity until 625, when a traveler arrived in the city of Rotwald, coming from the distant lands known as Darkon. Yurik von Karkov began to spread dissent and revolt among the population, and Henry's soldiers beat and imprisoned him, dragging him in chains before the Baron, who took special pleasure in interrogating and killing dissidents. If the Valakan reports are to be trusted, and are not a political propaganda repeated for countless decades until it became true, Yurik von Karkov, even wounded and chained, looked his opponent in the eye and swore that he would pay for his crimes against Valakan. The Baron laughed in his face, but he was surprised by Yurik, who somehow broke free of the chains and jumped on Henrik, breaking his neck with his bare hands. Yurik von Karkov took the post of Baron and absolute ruler of this domain. Reports say that the mist surrounding the realm dissipated, revealing unknown neighboring realms and lands. This event was interpreted and imposed by the new Baron as a sign of Utah divine approval for his ascension to power. Baron Yurik I ruled with a lighter hand than Henrik's. Despite being authoritarian and known for a violent temper, and brutally punishing those who dared to question his orders. He kept busy during his government years. He demanded a levy of workers to be assigned from each of the cities and villages, so that he could finish the construction started by his predecessor, a curious fortress in the middle of the woods, whose shapes resembled that of a big cat, named by him as Castel Pantara. Although the construction of this fortress has been concluded for a long time, even to this day a number of workers are still demanded and assigned by the cities and villages to work on its maintenance and expansions, and to work in the surrounding lands. As a political gesture, the Baron granted the mayors of each of the three big cities a seat on a council of rulers, but without actually dividing his authoritarian power. To reaffirm his strength, he created a private troop of soldiers known as the Black Leopards, composed of men taken from their village at a young age to undergo strict military conditioning to become absolutely loyal to Baron Karkov. Among his most problematic habits was his constant search for new wives, 
since year after year his current wife died of the fearsome white fever. However, the life of the Baron would come to an end after coveting the wife of a mad mage known as Felkovnik. Despite murdering the rival mage, Felkovnik had created an artifact to destroy the Baron, a small figurine of a feline which magically transformed her into a huge tiger to attack Baron von Karkov, fatally wounding him in the year 671. With the death of Baron Yurik I, his reclusive and until then unknown son emerged to take his place. The young man was very similar in appearance to his father and shared the same name, being known as Baron Yurik von Karkov II. The Baron also share his father's bad luck, since year after year the newly appointed Baroness, his most recent wife, perishes to the white fever, and he maintained the odious annual lottery to select a new wife. After his father's violent death, Baron Yurik II ruled more tyrannically. Its main associate in the government is the terrible Lady Adeline a mysterious elf with a veiled face, who is in charge of collecting the Baron heavy fees and taxes with the help of the merciless Black Leopards. The authoritarian behavior of the Baron and his associates led to a series of revolts between the years 680 and the year 730 that aimed to contest the heavy tax burden the compulsory assignment of men to work at Castle Pantera, and the annual lottery for selecting new brides. All these revolts were violently suppressed by Baron Karkov, and his leaders were punished in an exemplary manner. The more recent revolt occurred in the year 740, during the Grand Conjunction, when an assassination attempt almost succeeded in destroying the Baron by magical means. When the Baron was struck, reports say that the mist rose and terrible earthquakes shook Balakan, and when it was over, these lands were displaced by the mists. Some people claim that this was a sign from Utah that Baron Yurik II ruled with his approval, but I believe that this is no more than another piece of propaganda of the tyrannical ruler. Thus, we finish our account of the history of Valakan, a realm where the myths and beliefs of the population are confused with this tragic and violent history. But what secrets are hidden in these dense forests full of beasts and voracious predators? Subscribe to the channel and join us as we approach the imposing Castel Pantara to search for the powerful cat of Felkovnik a statuette of great power that has been lost inside its walls since the death of Baron Yurik I.